morning. Wow. That's a little better. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to Colorado. I'm, I'm from eastern Kansas, so this is a whole new world to me. Um, some of you may be wondering why do you have some guy from a high rainfall environment out here talking to you guys about farming and soil health. Uh, I think part of that is that, uh, first of all, I'm not going to give you my recipe, so you can put your pens and paper away because I'm not going to hand it out because it's not going to work here anyway. But what you need to do is to take the thought process. What is he doing in his operation that I can take to mine? Uh, you know, I, I've been very, very fortunate to spend the last day and a half with Brendan. I've got the jury's farm, and, and uh, Brendan and I are about 180 apart. I mean, we do a lot of things different, but our ultimate goals are the same. And, that, that's, and that's the goal, that's where, where we're headed, not where we are today. Uh, and I'm not saying that he's right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and he's wrong. It's just that you know, there's all kinds of different paths to get to where we're going. And I want to thank Brendan for the, for the great time, all the learning. But, I, I, you know, after the last couple of minutes, I'm really, really disappointed. I've spent two days in Colorado, being from Kansas, getting really tired of hearing about it. <laughs> but I gotta admit, I, I went to get me a glass of water and I cannot believe it. There was a blue cup and a red cup. What? You, you guys thought you were fans? <laughs> What's, Brendan, come on. Where's the orange cups? You guys are all cheese fans deep inside, aren't you? I live in Emporia, Kansas, uh, completely different than what we have here. I live in a, about a 35-inch rain environment. Uh, I live on the bank of the Neosho River, just northeast of Emporia. This is my son, Colby, my daughter, Kelsey. And these are some of the things that we deal with, or we used to, a few years ago. It hasn't been a problem lately. Uh, the, the beauty of the Neosho River sometimes isn't quite so pretty. And a lot of people in my world on my side of the hill, I think we have a huge runoff problem. I completely disagree. We have an infiltration problem. This is my beautiful house. This is where I live, on the bank of the Neosho. Go ahead. So I just kind of want to put things into perspective. You know, we all have our issues. People say, well, you get 35 inches of rain. Boy, that is wonderful. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. So today we're going to talk about farming and nature's image and, and why that's important. Whether you live in the desert or in high, high rainfall environments, irrigated, dry land, anywhere in between. We're also going to talk about things our forefathers didn't teach us. Or did they? Cover crops is, is, is not new science, people. I'm sure you've heard this from Brendan before, but cover crops have been around for hundreds and thousands of years. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they were using cover crops at the, at the dawn of this country. It's just something that we've gotten away from in the last hundred years. As commercial fertility and things become were cheap, it made it a lot easier to do what we were doing or so we thought. We have used land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And why do we not want to farm in nature's image? Because Mother Nature always wins. Now, I'm from Kansas. We have Missouri right next to us. And they're a little slow there in Missouri, and they have to show me. So, Mother Nature always wins. And those last two slides were about 80 years apart. You probably recognize the first one from the Dust Bowl. This photo here was taken. Oh, exactly. This photo this here was taken in 2011 in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, I spoke at the uh, Kansas Conservation District workshop a year ago in Wichita. And the year before that, the Secretary of Ag for Kansas got up in front of the soil districts and said, this will never happen again in Kansas. We are too smart. We know too much today to ever repeat the death bowl. Last Friday, the streetlights in Garden City, Kansas were on at noon. What have we learned from the first festival? Guys, I, I know on my side of the mountain, we're, we're knocking on the door. 
we're there again. We've had multiple dust storms in the last few years. And we try to make Mother Nature play by our rules. How does that work for us? And we try to contain her. This photo here was taken uh, a couple years ago. How many of you guys saw all the flooding they had on the Missouri River two, two summers ago through the Midwest? Uh, flooding in, uh, in the, down in the Midwest in the Corn Belt where it never rained. Those, those guys were going through the worst drought in 80 years and dealing with a flood at the same time. Uh, this picture here was a photo of a levee that got blown in Missouri. The government built it, and then the government decided that it was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they took it out to protect a small town. This is a family that's on the wrong side of that decision. We cannot fight our people. And, I, and whether you want to argue that there's global warming or global cooling or the next ice age is coming, I, I don't care. We can argue all day long about climate change. Uh, and I, I'm not smart enough to know the answer. I do know the man has an influence. And also know that if we don't learn to play by Mother Nature's rules, she's going to find some way that will. And I do know that we've had a lot of weather extremes in the last five or six years. I think you guys can probably attest to that. Uh, Brennan and I talked about this here way over. Maybe Mother Nature sending us her warning shot. She's looking for a new tenant. Uh, this is a scene that is all too common in my country. So the answer for us is to go to no-till. That's what this guy did. How did it work? How many times have you heard that no-till is the answer? No-till is not the answer. It's just a tool in the toolbox. It's the first step towards revitalizing the soil. This guy went to no-till, but he didn't change his rotation. He tried to fit, he tried to fit his old style of farming into no-till. That does not work. In our area, soybeans are king. If you're going to go long-term no-till, then soybeans are going to be your number one crop if you're heading for disaster. Probably as big or bigger than conventional till. I know this photo is a little hard to see, but this is the Gulf of Mexico. And you've all heard about the dead zone there. And a lot of farmers like to argue that it's not their fault. Well, I'm here to say that I'm one farmer that this is partially my fault. And what does this mean besides that the shrimpers really don't like us much anymore? That's my soil, my nitrogen, my phosphorus, my money, and my kids' future that we let do this year after year after year. And it's not just water erosion, as you guys all know. Wind plays a very, very huge part. The photo on the top left was a wreck on Interstate 70 a couple years ago, and a couple people were killed in the wreck. And on the news, they, every day they talk about the wind kicked up and blew the dust and they closed the interstate. Guys, the wind blows in western Kansas every day of the year. It's not the wind's fault. And it's only a matter of time until somebody figures that out. And guess who they're going, to have, they're going to come after in a situation like this? We live that firsthand. I live on the eastern slopes of the Flint Hills. Is anybody here familiar with the Flint Hills or heard of them? It's the largest unbroken track of prairie left on the planet. And it's just a beautiful area. Uh, sadly, the ranchers have, have uh, been told that the best way to manage that is with fire. Fire is an important tool, but they now use it every April 1st. They burn off almost every acre of the Flint Hills. Kansas Turnpike runs through the Flint Hills. A few years ago, there was a wreck of a turnpike during a fire. Our cars got lost in smoke. A lady was killed. They sued the rancher, and they won. The rancher died of a stroke a few years later. It's just a matter of time, people, before somebody holds us responsible. So we have a choice. We hold ourselves responsible or we wait for the government to tell us. And we're going to talk about this more and more in my presentation tomorrow, but, uh, those days are coming, they're getting really close, and we need to start paying attention. Uh, this was a dust storm last year in western Kansas that they picked up from satellite. On average in the U.S., five and a half ton of soil per acre per year is lost, and that's about where Kansas runs. My understanding is Colorado is double that, if not triple. We've lost 40% of the topsoil in Kansas in the last 100 plus years. Most of it due to bad farming practices. 
And granted, it's not all the farmers' fault. We've had help. We get pats on the back from the government and industry. Tell us what a great job we're doing. No single raindrop leads us to blame for the flood. It's kind of our mentality. And I, as I, I give this presentation to a whole bunch of producers, and I look out over the crowd, and I talk about the erosion rates, it, 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 it's kind of sad, really, because I, I see these, this farmer sitting there, and he's going, wow, those two guys are really bad farmers. <laughs> you know, it, it's, just, it's just our nature. We want to believe we're doing everything. I mean, we are the lucky chosen that have been, been picked to steward this planet, so we want to believe that we're doing everything we can. But I challenge you to go home and look in the mirror tonight and tell yourself you're doing everything you can do. Answer it for yourself. Don't, don't, don't let me tell you. So who's going to pay for my poor management? It's not the banker. It's not the landowners. This is who's going to pay for my screw-ups. You know, I already introduced you to my uh, son, Colby, my daughter, Kelsey. This is my girlfriend, Lynette's kids, Eric and Lucas. Eric is now married, and we have a grandson. This is who will pay for my mistakes, and I love my kids too much for that. So the buck stops now, it stops here, and it stops with me. We do not want soil, not only do we not want soil leaving our farm, we want to start to rebuild soil. And guess what? We can do it. And as you heard in the, in the movie, the, the scientists say you can do this, you can't do that. Well, scientists tell us it takes thousands of years to build an inch of topsoil. We can do it in years. It's being proven all over the planet. David Grant, Colin Sice. There's guys that are doing it, and they're doing it so fast that the scientists are calling them liars. But they can't argue with the results. David Brandt in Ohio started no-telling in 1972, cover crops in 1979. He has, they, they come out last year and tested his soil, and they can't classify it. There will become, we hope, there will become a Brandt soil in, in Ohio. He's middle soil, they can't identify it. That's how fast we can do this. There is hope. As David Montgomery mentioned, there is hope. It's time for the United States to stop paying for the degradation of soil. Dwayne Beck said that at the No Till and Plains Conference a couple years ago, and I fully believe it. And as, as a producer, this is part of our problem. We have become addicted to a lot of things, and one of them is government handouts. We've been told that we're commodity farmers, and we need to take their payments and they'll help us to survive. We're not commodity farmers, people. We are food producers. We've been told that for so long, we believe it. And as long as you believe you're a commodity farmer, you're, you're really not going to care. But once you realize you're a food producer, would you feed that food that you're growing to your kids? And if not, maybe some changes need to be made. This, this is a really disturbing map of soil degradation on the planet. You know, as we know, these soils here are thousands of years old. Um, if, if you've read the book, Dirt, by David Montgomery, you know, whether you want to believe in evolution or religion, I really don't care, but either way, life started right in here. The Garden of Eden was in northern Iraq, where man first stood up and walked out of northern Africa. They were both gardens. I don't care which side you want to believe in. What are they today? The desert. We have helped influence that. And the sad part is, you look at these soils, what have we learned from our ancestors? Very little. But today we're, there we go. Today we're on a race to get bigger. Uh, I, I don't know if the government wants one farmer per county or one per state or what their ultimate goal is, but in, in Kansas, that's where we are headed. Uh, to me, that's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, my local John Deere dealership, they have, they, in the last 10 years, they've gone from one dealer to 10. How much better do you think the parts department is? How much better do you think my service is? It's terrible. Bigger isn't always better, guys. Um, we, we, can, we can stack so many enterprises. We can make so much more dollars per acre. We are wasting so much time, talent, and resource right now trying to cover thousands of acres at a time. It's not funny. Essentially, all life depends upon the soil. There will be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. 
and modern research divides nature into tiny pieces and conducts tests that conform neither with natural law nor with natural or with practical experience. The results are arranged for the convenience of research, not according to the needs of the farmer, Matthew Newby. If you guys have not read any of his work, please do so. The guy was a genius. He was either 50 years ahead of or 100 years behind his time, I don't know which. But when a, when a farmer or a researcher looks at this little soybeans, what's the problem? That's, that's not what a farmer or researcher sees. Weeds. Right? Weeds are the enemy of man. But when a true producer looks at the soil, he sees bare ground. When Mother Nature looks at the soil, she sees bare ground. So research tries to find a way to get rid of these. Why are they there? Mother Nature hates bare soil. Weeds are the first responder. They're the things that she can get to grow the fastest to cover that back up to protect her planet from what we are doing to it. And so we do research so that we can grow monocultures and we can find ways to rid ourselves of pests. And we plant these monocultures on thousands and thousands of acres continuously. Who wins? Man or Mother Nature? Mother Nature always wins. She always finds a new way to get around us. So once again, we've outsmarted her. We've come up with GMO. We've come up with BT corn, right? Beat her this time. How's that working for us? We at Kansas lead the nation in resistant weeds to round up. Ten years is all it took. So what's the answer? 2,4-D beans, coming soon to a store near you. We're going to show her this time around. Many vegetables today appear to contain lower levels of vitamins and minerals than they did in 1975 according to official USDA nutrient <laughs> data. A random sample of USDA, D, USDA data on a dozen vegetables showed that calcium has fallen an average of 26.5%. Vitamins A and C dropped 21.4 and 29.9 percent, and iron is plummeted by an average of 36.5 percent. Livestock producers don't pat yourself on the back. Beef, lamb, pork, same thing. Now, beef roast today has about 20 percent less iron than it had 20 years ago. It kind of goes back to us being commodity farmers and food producers. Why has this happened? This is just my opinion, but I believe that as we have tilled and mined the soil for the last 100 to 120 years, we've removed all the nutrients from the soil. What have we replaced? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Maybe some sulfur and zinc. If you guys now start to put in a little copper, you know, we just begin to scratch the surface. So if we mine the soil and the nutrients aren't there, what's in the plant? Uh, the, the only Justification I have for my opinion is on my mentor, my friend Gabe Brown's ranch in North Dakota. His cows eat very little mineral today. Now, I bought some of his stocks. I wanted those good genetics. I brought them back to my farm in Kansas. He lied to me. Those cows eat mineral like it's Christmas candy. How come? What's that? Plants don't have it. Gabe's about five years ahead of me in his, his, uh, track to soil health, and he has started to replenish his soil naturally with all those nutrients. And the cow's not getting it from the plant, doesn't need it from the bucket. That's one less check Dave has to write. This is what we can do. So if that cow's not getting all those nutrients from the soil, where do you want to buy your steak? You want to buy it from Gabe, you want to buy it from the grocery store. You know, I, and we're going to talk a little more, we're going to get more in depth with this tomorrow. But, uh, really something we need to be looking at. And the answer, as you've heard all morning and you're going to hear tomorrow and the rest of the day, is soil health. So how do we get there? Well, you have to take a walk out of your farm field and get into nature, whatever it is in your area. In my area, it's the tall grass prairie. In other areas, it's timber. Whatever, whatever your natural setting is, what is Mother Nature doing in your system? In those last two pictures, what did you not see? Disturbance in a monoculture, right? Mother Nature doesn't like either one of them. And not, not only do we not have a monoculture here, but look at all the layers in this timber, in this forest. 
you've got tall trees and short trees, you've got shrubs and brushes, you've got grass, and you know if you get this zoomed in, you'd be algae and little plants crawling along the ground and vines crawling up. That's true diversity. Diversity isn't planting 10 different kinds of oak trees. We need lots of diversity, tall things, short things, wide things. And, and if you flip them over, the, the roots would be the exact same thing, and that's why we talk about diversity, one at above ground and below ground. Because if you flip that timber over, you'd have big, long, deep tap roots, right? And then little roots running right along the top, and fibrous roots, they'd just be spread out all over. And why do we, go back, I'm sorry. So why do we want diversity as farmers? Well, the aha moment for, I think, almost all of us came in 2006, because in 2000, or in early 2006, Gabe Brown and Jay Fury came to Salina, Kansas, to the No Till in the Plains Conference because they were trying to figure out how to run Gabe's farm without fertilizer. Gabe had gone broke through a series of hailstorms and was trying to find a way to get away from inputs. They came to Salina to listen to a guy from South America named Dr. Adamir Calagari. Dr. Adamir talked of diversity, cover crops, soil health, all these things we'd never heard of. And Gabe and Jay took that message, and I talked about recipes earlier, and I'm not giving you mine, because they, get, they figured this out from a guy from South America. Now, you think taking my recipe from Kansas over the divide to Colorado is a little wild. Gabe and Jay went back to Bismarck and started talking to their neighbors about this South American, and we're going to do what he's doing in Bismarck. How do you suppose that went over? And so they found them some cover crop seed, and they planted it. They planted several, several things. 2006 was, I believe, the driest year on record in Bismarck, North Dakota. They had an inch of rain during the entire growing season. So all their research out the window, right? They planted tillage radishes. And uh, this photo was taken on July 31st, and this is what they had. They planted turnips. They planted eight or 10 different things in monoculture. So they got all done, they threw a mole in the drill, and planted a mole in a, in a polyculture. And if you look really close, it's kind of hard to see. You see this little brown square right here? That's where the radishes and the turnips and all those things were. How did this happen? Square rainstorm? Will isolated showers pop up? Somebody explain this. How did this happen? And this is where it gets hard for guys like Brennan and me. I mean, we're, we're not rocket scientists here. We're starting to understand what goes on underneath the soil, <coughs> way above us. And sometimes you just have to have confidence in your system. When you start to feed the soil, and when your emphasis becomes on the soil and not on your wallet, good things start to happen to both. They awoke their system. Monocultures starve the system. There's not everything there to feed the earthworms and the mycorrhiza fungi and the bacteria and the protozoa and whatever else that system needed. But this is what they did with their first polyculture cover crop. This is how fast we can do it, guys. To be a successful farmer, one must first know the nature of the soil. So I, I talked about no-till just being a tool. This is a prime example. This is one of my neighbor's farms. He's a really, really good no-tiller. He's been no-tilling almost as long as I have. We dug this. This is actually my son bought eight acres off of him, and this is we was doing some exploring day brand nine. This is some of their almost 20-year no-till soil. That is some really, really nice soil in our area. I mean, that, that's really starting to heal itself. You can see some roots in there, and you can see some life. We went and dug this out of the road ditch. Which do you want? We're doing great things, but we're just getting started. We've got so much more we can do. From the I don't know department, this is, if you've heard of glomalin, this is what Dr. Chris Nichols helped discover a few years ago, is these glues that these microbes build from the excretions that, that tie to the roots. And I don't know about out here, but in Kansas, some of the biggest pushback I get is we can't no-till because the soil's too cold and too wet. No-till soil is cold and wet in the Midwest. It takes too long to warm up in the spring. We can't get our corn planted on time, which I'm not sure what on time is anymore. It's in March. Anyway. But if you look really close, this photo was taken January 22nd. Notice Dave's dressed up pretty good. It's pretty cold that day. We mostly frost killed. The temperature was in the teens. 
see the earthworm? He's down just over an inch. Do earthworms like cold soil? Absolutely not. What's he doing there? Do I have earthworms or what? You can dig earthworms every month out of the year on my farm. It's, it's not uncommon to find earthworms now in December, January, February. When you start to keep the soil buffered, you protect it from the wind, you protect it from the rain, you protect it from all the violence that Mother Nature throws, but also, I have all this life in here now. All these in the millions of microbes, and they're alive, and they do three things, and I'll, I'll make this much simpler than some of these scientists can do. And this came from Chris Nichols, who's one of the smartest people on the planet. What do microbes do? Eat, poop, and have sex. Three things. <laughs> And when she said that, she blushed so bad that she realized what she said, but it's the truth. It's all they do. They're alive. They eat, poop, and they have sex. Those are all good things. And they're, so they're breathing, right? And when they do all that, they just reproduce. Every time they eat, poop, and have sex, there's more of them to do it. And the soil is alive and it's breathing. So you've got the, t the temperature is buffered now. Our soils don't get as cold. You know, in Kansas, the soil temperatures do this. We get to 110 in the summer, we can get to 10 below in the winter. And so this is what our soil temperatures do. In a healthy no-till system or a field like this, my soil temperatures do this. We still get too hot and too cool, but we're buffered. The extremes aren't near as bad. And again, this is how you do this. You imitate Mother Nature. You want as many different things out there as you can get at any given time. So how do we do it? It's really hard. Get the planter up with the tractor. Put some seed in the box, go to the field, put the planter down, and plant. Uh, as you can see, this isn't much of a drill. I went through a divorce in the, in the mid-2000s and lost just about everything. So I use what I have, I use what I can find. I can't afford all the fancy stuff and you don't need it. It's not, the divorce hasn't all been bad for me. There's been a lot of good aha moments. There is no attachments on this drill. It is what it is, and it does just fine. Uh, I did have a pretty nice planter. This is back in 2011. Uh, this is a Kinsey planter. The only thing we have on this are some Thompson closing oils. And I'm starting to wonder, because we have issues with things wanting to wrap, but there's no residue managers. You know, the, the, the secret to planting into this is weight on the planter and a sharp worker. It's not rocket science. It's very, very easy to do. As you can imagine, the more add-ons you put on this planter, what's it going to do going through that? And whoever sold you that add-on, did he have your best interest at heart or his? Whose kids are he putting through school? Uh, when you guys want to go buy a product, and I don't care what it is, if it's fertilizer, iron, chemical, we need to ask more questions. And you, you know, I, I started a lot of my presentations, and I can't do it today because I don't have my truck here, but go out in the parking lot and look at my truck. There's no sign on the door. I'm not selling you guys anything but a message. So if you buy into it, great. If not, I'm not going to go broke. But I'm not selling anything. But those guys that are, you, you need to be asking them questions. Because whose best interest do they really have at heart? Sadly, many of them just trying to make a buck for themselves. So this is the corn. You just seen the Kinsey planter going through the, the uh, cover crop. This is the corn one week later. This is the corn a few weeks later, and here we are in August. Okay. So where have we come on our operation? You, you saw the quick burn down. We, we come in and we will plant the corn or the, the cash crop into cover crop, and then we will come in and spray a burn down to kill it out. Um, this is the direction we're wanting to head. My neighbor and I bought this crop roller a year ago and we're trying it out on our farms. He is having huge success. Um, his cover crop mainly is cereal rye. Mine are mixes. I'm struggling a lot with the roller because it's hard to get all those mixes mature at the same time so that we can get them killed. That's the, the key to making a crop roller work is the, the cover crop has to be mature. And that's a lot harder for me to do than it is for Kevin. Uh, the, the neat thing, this is his daughter Chris Ann. Chris Ann and her little brother Randall run the, the roller for Kevin. Um, they're 17 and 15 years old. My son and daughter is 27 and 25. So Kevin's kids 10 years younger than mine. My kids never learned how to till. And in, in the 
early years, I wondered if I was a bad dad. <laughs> you know, did I not teach them all they needed to know? Today, I'm very, very proud of the fact that my kids don't know how to tell. How cool is it if the kids 10 years younger than mine never learn how to spray? How awesome would that be? How fast are we getting there, guys? It's just amazing how fast this is, is going once we're starting. Here, there's the roller, there's Dad Kevin with the drill, drilling right behind the roller. And the, the roller is a great idea, but is it a necessity? The drill we have here does just fine. As you see here, we get about 99% kill on our cover crops. Is that enough? Well, that's for you to decide. You know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So diversity, these are some of the things we've grown on our farm in the last year. I, I need to update this because it, it's gotten a lot higher than that now. And you don't need to necessarily look at the ingredients, but look, we have grasses, brassicas, legumes, broadleaves. We have warm season, cool season. We have perennials, we have annuals, we have flowers. We, we're not putting in herbs. Everything has a different purpose. So before you start throwing these mixes together, you need to do some homework. Some of them have some bad consequences. Hairy vetch, hard seeded. If you plant hairy vetch once, you get hairy vetch three times. I love it. That's free forage for my cows. But there are guys that don't care for that. So you need to understand what all these things can do on their own or in a monoculture before you start throwing them into a polyculture because some of them do have some consequences. Uh, some of them are heavy water users, some of them are not. So uh, you, know, you need to ask some questions. This goes back to the, I don't know and I don't care, I'm not smart in the department. This is a friend of mine about 40 miles up the road. He runs a feedlot, and they are very progressive for some feedlot owners. They understand they have some phosphorus issues around the feedlot. They're trying to address that, and they're trying to use some coverage to grow some soil health. They're, they're no-tilling, and we've been, in 2011, 2012, we had no rainfall. This field here, they had winter wheat. They harvested the wheat for grain, and he says, I know it was wrong, but we bailed off some of the straw. We left about six inches of residue to try to keep some cover on the ground, but we were so starved for forage that sometimes in those two years we had to do some things we didn't like. After they bailed the residue off, or the straw off, they come in and planted this forage sorghum crop for uh, silage for their cow, cattle. Uh, they had plenty of moisture to get this crop up when they planted it, and this is what they had. This would have been about six weeks after they planted it. If you go down the road about a mile from this crop, they had a, a crop of oats and peas that they planted in the spring. They chopped them for haylage for the feedlot. And when you chop an oat pea crop, there is zero residue left. It looks like this, this floor, as bare as it can be. He sent the, the planter guy out to plant the same forage sorghum crop here in the oat pea crop. And the guy radioed back to the office because I'm bringing the planter back. I can't cover the seed, it's laying on top of the ground. I, I've got everything full max down, and we can't get the planter in the ground, we're going to have to quit. And the owner says, no, we're going to have to pray for rain, we need to, we have to have feed, we're going to have to plant it and hope. So they planted the forage sorghum crop. This is what they got. How did that happen? It's way above me. It goes back to what we've been talking about, all this microbial activity and all this life in the soil. Um, Chris Nichols talks about not only do these microbes eat, poop, and have sex, but they're, they're not only transporting nutrients back and forth, but they also transport water. They can't make you a one-inch rain, but there is moisture there. <laughs> is this magic? It looks like it to me, but I, I know in, in time we're going to figure out what else is going on in the soil. Probably not going to happen in our lifetime. How much can we do in a dry environment if we just have some confidence in our system? And when you get into a long term no till system, you need to take everything you know about farming and throw it out the window. Because one plus one no longer equals two. And if you try to farm like you farmed for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, it's going to burn you. If he, what if he had not had confidence in his system? How much forage did he grow here? by having confidence in this system. Excellent with the confidence for him, it was desperation. It shows what we can do with confidence. So, the next step, 
in, in diversity is companion cropping. You know, once again, Mother Nature hates a monoculture, so I, I truly believe we need to find ways that we've got things growing with our cash crops all the time. Uh, this here is a winter barley crop with a clover mix planted into it. So why do we want companions this year? We're actually planting for winter canola in our area. It also has the same clover mix in it. Uh, why companions? Well, this is one reason. We can protect the predator or the, the uh, pollinators, bring in more insects, because we need everything in the system. It's not all just about the below ground insects. We've got all these above ground insects well, that we, we really have not taken account for. And uh, this leads to another discussion that when we think holistically and we think about the entire system, we think about an ecosystem, we have to think of that system as a whole. What does one management decision do to that ecosystem, to that whole? When you have an insect problem, and I know honeybees aren't a problem, but we have plenty of insects chewing on our cash crops, and you call in that aerial strike to wipe out that insect, you're doing so to protect your bottom line so that you can make enough money today to operate tomorrow. But what's that doing to your operation next week, next month, next year? How many guys here today have their cropping plan in place for the year? One? Two? Come on, guys. Three? I got everybody asleep, Brendan. Right? Mm -hmm. Three guys in this room have their cropping plan for this year in place. <coughs> Pretty sure that's probably not true. How many of you guys have your cropping plan in five years? How many of you guys have thought about what your farm's going to look like in 10 years? How about in 50 years? We're, we've become so focused with, with the government and industry's help on making enough pennies today that we can operate tomorrow that we've forgotten about the future. And when we call in that strike on those insects or on those weeds or whatever it is, you wipe out all of the population. When you wipe out an insect, when we wipe out an aphid in an alfalfa crop in Kansas, what's the first insect to come back? The aphid. The predators take a lot longer to recover from insecticide spray than the prey do. And so in Kansas, we've gone from spraying a monoculture alfalfa crop. 20 years ago, we had to start spraying for aphids in the spring just before harvest. Today, they're having to spray three times. We just continue to nuke. The only things coming back are the aphids. The honeybees. Um, there was some research paper come out a couple years ago about the honeybees, and, and it was, uh, I work with an entomologist named Dr. Jonathan Weinger, and this guy is absolutely brilliant, and I'm pretty sure he's gonna be out here speaking in the very, very near future. And this guy, he gets it. But even Jonathan, even Dr. Nichols was telling us, some of the safest things you can do if you have to have insecticide is use a seed treatment. That's much safer than bringing in the aerial attack. And then a new research paper come out just about a year and a half, two years ago. The number one killer of the honeybee, dust off the planter, off the seed treatments. It's not Dr. Lundgren's fault, it's just something nobody thought of. I mean, we were worried about this, the drift and the spray and the actual contact. It's the dust off the seed from the plant, the, the plate going across, creating the dust, and the bees flying through it. And so, in my system, we, we are not using seed treatments anymore. We, but I don't recommend that for you. You can't just say, well, I want to save the honeybee, so I'm not going to treat my seed. We built our soil health. We do testing. We have our predator prey counts and our soil biology to the point that we no longer need seed treatments on our seed. Build it and they will come, Dr. Lundgren's favorite word, and this is really hard to see, and you can spend all day here counting ladybugs. There's thousands and thousands. Uh, this was in that canola crop that you saw a few slides earlier, and, and I know this is really, really hard, guys, and your livelihood depends on taking this crop to harvest, but we had aphids come into this canola crop, and I had a choice to make. And it's really, really hard to do, because it's, you're talking about your bottom line. You're talking about buying this, your kids' shoes. But I went home, I said, I'm gonna wait two days. I'm not, I'm not gonna go drive by that field, I don't even wanna look at it for two days because it's too tempting. I went back two days later, this is what I found. Aphids everywhere, or not, yeah, aphids, aphids were still there. Ladybugs everywhere. And then a couple days after that, it was all ladybugs. They can consume an awful lot of aphids in a hurry. 
I know it's hard to be patient, but if you let Mother Nature drive the bus, she will help you, but you have to help her first. Butterflies and all these things start to show up when you start to let Mother Nature drive the bus. And I, I kind of learned early on when we started to see more flushes of insects, and I started studying them, I started finding out, you know for every insect on, known on the planet that can damage your crop, how many predators are there? Anybody know? You're right, a lot. 3,500 insects that are either predators or we don't even know yet what they are. These are the big bugs above ground. We don't even know yet what all's out there. But we do know for every prey, for every insect that does damage to your cotton, your corn, your wheat, whatever it is, there's 3,500 insects out there that are predators or we don't know. And we want to nuke that one. And then after the insects, guess what follows the insects? The birds. And they, have, they now come in with the thousands. We have a species of birds I've never seen before. They come and they go. Some of them there all summer, summer, some of them show up for a day or two. We've got bobolinks, we have meadowlarks that are starting to become extinct in Kansas. I, I've got meadowlarks galore. The quail are starting to rebuild. We have pheasant on our farm. We're one of the few farms in eastern Kansas that have pheasant. Pheasant's a big crop in western Kansas. But when you let Mother Nature play by her rules, all of these things happen. And these are just more predators. They're eating the good bugs, the bad bugs. They don't care, they just eat. They eat it all. And they get bigger. And bigger. And they come by the hundreds and the thousands. As you can imagine, when you've got that, all those things going out there in our field, that's a buffet, guys. And, and you've now got another choice to make. Gabe Brown has got his system to the point where he has to build wildlife into his grazing plan. He has to set aside 10 to 15% of his grazing every year for deer. He doesn't have a choice, because if he doesn't, they're going to come and take it. They don't need a written agreement. So he just writes it into his plan. Now you can view this as a problem or an opportunity. Because what would somebody from Denver pay you for a shot at him? They'll pay you a lot of money. Turn it into money. No way to turn cash crops into cash. Cover crops into cash. So some of our early work with, with uh, companion crops, our first year in 08 and 09, we did some training clover and corn and Dr. Joe Clarkton was helping me and I said, you know, why are we doing sub clover? That's one more, you know, we double it. We've added one more thing to the mix. That's not much of a mix. So today we're looking at, at putting in a clover mixture. We put in three or four different clovers. We put in vetch, we put in flowers. We put in all kinds of different things and we put in flax. And part of that, you know, because the insects, you know, they need something there all the time. So if you put diversity out there, we got different things flowering this week and next week. Um, some of these are nitrogen fixtures, some of them aren't. Uh, we want to do, they all have different roles, whether it's a cover crop or a companion crop. Each species in that mix has a role it plays. Here we are later on in June, and this is 2011, if you can't see it in the back. Um, this was our first really full dry year. Uh, by the end of June, we would received our last rain, and, and this is what, what it looked like. And we were, we were on course for 150 to 200 bushel corn on June 22nd. On June 30th, my friend Ray Archuleta came to visit the farm. Ray is standing here. You guys have all heard of Ray's been out here, right? Yeah. So you all know how Ray is. He's looking down at my companions right here. You go back here about 100 feet, there's no companions, just to kind of give you a reference of how much damage I'm causing my corn. Ray is just in shock looking at this. This is on June 30th. July 14th, July 24th, 24 days later, the corn was dead. And everybody said, hey, I told you. Used all your water. I told you that was going to happen, Gail. You wouldn't listen. And uh, this road here, this was August 2nd. The corn we're waiting now on a chopper. Look at the spiders. Look at the predators that come in. We have so many spiders now. If you've got a phobia of spiders, don't plant cover crops because they will come with the billions. So we had to chop the corn off. The cover crop was still nice and green. Uh, the next day it turned white with the heat. This was on August 22nd. Go ahead. On August 29th, my state agronomist showed up and wanted to tour my cover crops for my companions. 
And so this is the cornfield that we just chopped and we dug down three inches and we have moisture. Whoops, how'd that happen? And a lot of people wanted to blame my companion crop for rubbing all my moisture in this crop. 2011 for us, it was just too hot. I mean, we just cooked everything. The corn protected the cover crops and kept them alive. That was why they were still green. That, those covers, by the way, are mostly a cool season crop. Almost everything I had in that mix was cool season. Cool season doesn't live in Kansas in July and August. Why were they alive? This, the corn helped some, but it also set diversity. So we planted the cover back on it to get the ground covered again to protect it. Uh, I'm working with companions on soybeans. This is going to be a very tricky one, but again, you know, I, I'm of the belief we, we've got to find a way to make this work, or maybe I need to find something else to put in my rotation besides soybeans. So again, if, if you can't find the answer, just take a walk in nature. Um, she will give you the answers. You just need to learn to listen. How are we doing on time? We're good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay. Okay, last piece of the puzzle, I certainly hope not. I hope I have a lot more to learn. So I hope this is just maybe the next step. Uh, in Kansas, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, the great herd roamed the prairie. Um, it's estimated there's around 60 million bison that roamed the prairies at one time. Uh, and how, how did the, and it wasn't just bison. And it wasn't just a great, there was diversity there also. You know, there were, there were elk and antelope and deer and all these other things and the predators followed it. But how did the bison work? There weren't fences, but there were these huge, huge herds and they came from what we would call a mob. They came, they ate, they pooped, they peed, there was nothing left and they had to move on to greener pastures. And they might come back in six months, they might not come back for two years. And for hundreds of years, the prairie survived just fine without commercial fertilizer, without FSA payments, without Roundup. How did it do it without all of our help? So what we want to do we, to emulate nature in our system, we need livestock back on the ground. And that was one of the early faults of no-till back in the, in the 80s and 90s. We kicked the livestock off. You, you can't destroy the ground with livestock and expect to grow a cash crop. We were wrong. Today, we know we need them there. So, last, again, last piece of the puzzle, maybe just the next step. So what we do today, we try to emulate the buffalo with our cattle. We have to use fencing, so we use electrical fencing, we use reels, we keep the cattle tight, we move them fast, and then we let the ground rest. And we may come back in a few weeks, a few months, maybe not for a year or two. Again, I talked about I live on the steps of the beautiful Flint Hills, and it is just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. This is the way the Flint Hills are being managed today. You take the trucks out in the spring after you've burned everything off, you dump the cattle out, and in this fall you go back and pick them up. The cattle will spend the entire summer selecting which grass they want to eat. And every time that grass gets clipped off and it shoots back a new sprout, and you got this new sprout here and you got the old grass over here, which bites the cow going to take tomorrow? So after 50 years or 100 years of this management, who's in charge? Cows. And in 2011, I talked about how dry we were. Um, the grazing season for us runs from uh, early May to uh, mid-October. October 15th is usually the date you have to be off the grass. So what do we do in the dry year? October 30th, we had no hay at home, no feed, we let the cows out. Find something to eat. What do you suppose we've done to that system in two years of drought? We've set it back decades because of our management. So I mentioned that the buffalo had diversity, and I want diversity, and not just this. And this is kind of hard to see, but this isn't one calf, this is two. None of them are hers. It's okay, that's what I want. I want them calves finding a meal anywhere they can. This is the diversity I want to see. So two years ago, Lynette went to uh, this man's farm and we bought a few of his sheep, and now we're working on integrating sheep in with our cattle. 
and it doesn't stop there. I, I, you know, growing up in corn, soybean country and feedlot country, you ate steak, and if you mentioned chicken, you took the wrath for dad. And my kids took the wrath for me when we went to McDonald's and got chicken nuggets. Didn't care for my kids doing that. You ate steak, and you raised beef. So this one was kind of hard to swallow for me. This is an absolute no-brainer, guys. I mean, these things make the system work. We now have layers and boilers. So, in the early years of cover crops, a lot of them were harvested mechanically. We, we uh, th this actual picture is from Gabe's. Uh, he and I both had the same, the same flaws. We had to make those cover crops make us money this year. We had to prove to the bank that we could do it. So we chopped them off, hauled them to town, fed the cattle, whatever. What I found on my farm was on my ground where we were pushing soil health the hardest. We had a living root for 10 years solid on a piece of ground. Our organic matter did this. We had ground where we just had a diverse rotation and no cover crops it was doing this. We, were not, we weren't going anywhere. We were building the soil health, we were building the microbiology, we weren't building the organic matter. And organic matter drives the bus. For every percent of organic matter you can increase, you increase your water holding capacity one inch per acre. What's your organic matter here, guys? Less than one percent. What's your organic matter? Was it three? No, in the back of the in his three percent. I'm wrong in the In the back of the back of the wall. Yeah, John. Yeah, Jack. Jack, what's your Jack? What's your organic matter? Two percent. He holds one inch more water than everybody else. And, he, and what's your goal? Where are you going? The sky's the limit. The biggest limiting factor in agriculture today is two things. What's the, what's the single most limiting factor in your crop's life? Water, most guys in my area say nitrogen, carbon. But the thing about that, the biggest limiting factor to agriculture today, right here, <laughs> human brain. Nobody took, now whether they tell Jack he can or can't, Jack truly believes he can go to 6%, not believing. That's a pretty tall order in this country. On my farm, we when we started no-till in the, in the 90s, the last soil test we did was in 1997. That was two years into no-till, or our first soil test into no-till. We were 1.7 to 2.5 percent organic matter. That was our range across our entire farm. Today, we are 3.5 to 6.4 percent. Most of it is 4.5 to 5. That's how fast we can build this. So look what I've done to my water holding capacity. Um, every 1% organic matter is about 25 pounds of nitrogen that's available if the system is alive. There's a catch there. You can't just go out and harvest it. The system has to be alive. Uh, you know, I talk about being addicted. We're addicted to nitrogen. We have 30,000 ton of nitrogen hovering over every acre of your land. Free. 30,000 a ton. How much are we harvesting? Why are we buying it when Mother Nature gives us more than we'll ever use? Uh, got off, got get off my soapbox back to harvesting cover crops. <laughs> we found in the last few years um, some South Americans had to come up and get on Dwayne Beck, and Dwayne Beck had to get on us, and he came to Salina and he said, and you guys have heard Dwayne Beck, maybe, maybe you haven't. He's kind of to the point, more than me. And he stood up in front of about 1,200 farmers, and he goes, farmers are the stupidest people I know. <laughs> yeah, and they laughed. Usually they throw stuff at me when I say that. And they laughed because you guys spent all summer bailing hay. You spent all fall hauling hay to the farm, all winter hauling the hay to the cow, and all spring hauling the used hay back to the farm, back to the ground. They're portable. They have legs. Why were we chopping it and hauling it to them? As Gabe says, they work for me. I no longer work for them. 
Take them to it. Look at how many passes we just saved. Look at the organic matter we're putting in the soil by letting them harvest the force. And look at how much residue he removed here. And he's feeding his cows, and yet he's still feeding his soil here by leaving a lot more residue. So, we, be, we started working on rotational grazing, and I think there's plenty of opportunity in my area to turn that into cash in more ways than one. We're increasing our cow herd. Uh, we're starting to direct market grass-finished beef. But also what we're going to do now, what we've learned through the drought, is we'd better have a plan. And our plan is in the wet years, if we ever see them again, and we have excess forage, we will bring in stalkers and custom graze. And so, and the, and the grazing of the cover crops has become such a benefit to Gabe, that is now one year of his rotation. He takes one year and doesn't plant a cash crop. He plants two cover crops, raises them both off, returns himself three to three hundred fifty dollars an acre off the grazing, and builds all of his fertility for the next year. He's grown 160 bushel corn with no fertilizer, no inputs, period. One chemical pass every three years. And it's because of this. And it's because of all of this, not just one part of it. The system as a whole. And again, build it and they will come. We put we quit putting insecticide on our ground. Why are we still putting it on our cows? So four years ago, we we injected our cows for the last time, and guess what? Same thing happened behind the cows. We have dung beetles, dung flies. We have all these little critters that I've never, some of them never even seen before start to show up. A couple of years ago, um, two days into breeding season, my bull went lame. So that's not very good you got one bull. Called around, finally found a neighbor that had one he wasn't using, told us we could have it, went and loaded him up. Hold him about 15 miles to my cows and dumped him out. Coming out of a conventional system, look at his back. What do you see on my cows? He looked like that for almost a month. The cowbirds wanted nothing to do with him. I have, I have a huge flock of cowbirds following my cows around, picking the flies off. Now, I'm not cow, or I'm not fly free. I have plenty of flies, but you never see a load like this. I assume the flies were poisoned from his insecticide and my cowbirds wanted nothing to do with them until that worked its way through the system of the bowl and they picked him off and cleaned him up. <coughs> so we, uh, we started doing rotational grazing. Um, at, the, at the time in 2010, we only had 15 acres of perennials in our operation. And so we set up these poly wires and we, we're going to do rotational grazing. We, we did this nine acre field they came on the first weekend after harvest. Nobody really wanted to work that hard that weekend, so we just decided to let the cows move once a day through here so we could get a little bit of a break. And so we set it up, let the cows do it, and move through it. Monday morning, we came back to work, and this is four acres right next to it. It's the same perennial mix, and we got more intense, and we made the cows move three to four times a day. Uh, this is the cows actually going into a new paddock. And you can see them here settling in, eating off. This has been grazed off. This is not. Uh, you can see this brown strip here. We have it running through both these fields. And the reason we first sowed these down, you can see the feedlot in the background. The feedlot was still operating at that time. And this is our waste systems. The state had set it up for us. Uh, this is the buffer area into another ditch where the, the manure, feedlot manure buffers out. Obviously, that would be pretty hard to farm, that's why we set it down to perennials to help catch more of those nutrients. But it's still pretty hard, so we get a lot of undesirables in here. When we were grazing once a day, cows didn't touch it. We never grazed it three or four times a day. As you can see here, they mowed us off. You know, they, they ate, and that's one thing. When you put them in that mob, that competition factor becomes so intense. You better get something to eat, because she's eating something and she's eating something. So I better eat something. So our cows now, they, they're much less selective. They take a bite of everything they can get and move on and try to find the next bite. This is how we move them. This is a solar-powered digital timer. Um, comes from New Zealand, costs about $450. Set the timer. When you want the cattle to move, this is attached to a spring-loaded gate. Whenever you want the cattle to move, the timer goes off. Trigger releases the gate, throws the gate open. Cows walk into the next paddock. We show up once a day or once a week and set up in the fences however you want in front of them, and the cows move themselves. 
Now, my cows, have, we've been doing three or four years of rotational grazing, or what I thought was rotational grazing before I met Gabe Brown and Neil Dennis. Uh, we were moving the cows every few days, every few weeks. So they, they knew what a hot wire was. They knew what a different four wheeler showed up to move them. It only took them three days to figure this out. We had to show them three days and manually move them through until they figured it out themselves. And they hear that little beeper go off. They're standing there when the gate comes open. If not, they hear the spring fly open. When we go to move the cows to a new field now, we don't take cubes because cubes cost money and I don't spend money. I don't have any money. So I can't have any cubes to bake the cows. How do you move the cows? You strap one of these spring gates to the back of the four-wheeler. You get to the gate to where you want the cows to come to. You jump off the four-wheeler, you grab the spring gate, and you let it go. And they come running. Yeah, that's tricky the cows and so on. So what did we get from our, our first round of really intense grazing? This was the four-acre paddock where we moved the cows three to four times a day. This is the following summer, June 15th. This had already been grazed once. This is the nine acre paddock where we move the cows once a day on June 15th. It had been grazed once. Now, I, I don't think you can do this every time, but it shows you the possibilities we have when we mimic Mother Nature. And the guys that are doing this, and have been doing this for 10 or 15 years in a perennial system, what they're seeing, call it size and, and Australia has built 30 inches of soil in 20 years doing mob grazing and pasture cropping. And the species that are coming back from the seed bank, they, they counted over almost 150 different species of plants now on Neil Dennis's ranch in Canada. And he hasn't added any of them. They're showing up on their own. They're coming back from the seed bank as he's letting Mother Nature do the work for him. The value of residue is priceless. Dwayne Beck has been beating us into us for years. But like I said, I'm too close to Missouri sometimes. And I have to learn that lesson the hard way. Uh, this goes back to the drought in 2011. There's a fence line right here. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, this was a cereal rye grain crop that we harvested for grain. Uh, this was an oak pea crop that we, we had intended to harvest for grain, but because of the drought, it became the emergency stockpile for the cattle. And it flash cooked about the second day the cattle were in grazing. It just flash dried in the cattle, between the cattle eating it to the ground and it dying and dissolving. I mean, there, there was bare ground left. Um, we come in after the harvest of cereal rye. We planted a warm season mix just a few days apart on both of these fields. That's the exact same mix. And this is what we have. Middle of August, end of August where we had cover, protected the soil, had residue, we have something to eat. Where we left the bare ground, naked, hungry, starving, whatever Ray calls it. Mother Nature coming and took over, planted me some big weeds, and that's all we had to do with this. Um, like I said, we're including vegetables. We throw squash in a lot of our mixes. They have uh, deworming properties for cattle. So again, research everything you're using. There's, we, they have lots of different things besides just feeding me. We, Deworm the cows with them. Our goal is to graze year round. Um, the drought kind of cut us back in 11 and 12. We didn't quite make it. We're going to make it this year. We've got enough forage. We are not going to put hay off the cows. Um, this was our first attempt in 2010. This is a 10 acre warm season mix that we grazed off. And we, uh, we're keeping the cattle really tight. Look at the manure placement I'm getting. That, that early picture, several slides back, where I showed you through some of the graves of the cows out in the Flint Hills where they just turn out 80 head on several hundred acres and go home for a few months. It takes about 20 years in that grazing system that we use to get one cow pie per square yard. I can do it in a few hours. I don't have the manure at the pond or the water tank in a system like this. We can keep it where we want it, where we don't have to move it. Uh, this was my water source. There's a gate down here. The cows are out here. They're coming down here to the gate into the water. You can count five, six, seven, eight cow pies. We've got them all out where we want them. Um, this won't be as much of an issue for you guys, but one of the first the big pushback we get is, is what happens when it rains. Uh, we had a freak. We don't get a lot of moisture in January, but we had a freak rain event. We had one inch of rain the day the cows sit on this paddock. 
That's all the damage they did. That was 56 cows standing on a sixth of an acre for one day with one inch of rain. Um, what if we'd had the cows running on the whole 10 acres? They'd have mucked the whole thing up. We mucked up a sixth of an acre and really only a couple of inches deep. And by the time we'd come in there the next spring with our bee crop, you could hardly tell anything was wrong except for the residue was gone. Snow doesn't bother them. They, they know how to spread out and find it. And they graze right through it. Uh, we don't put hay out in snowstorms anymore. Uh, they know how to go out and find the forage. My cows are pretty photogenic with my speaking now. They, they all fight to get their pictures taken and see who's in the front row. <coughs> So what did we learn from that, that first year of winter grazing instead of hauling the feed to the cattle? Uh, this is an NRCS number. One beef unit puts out about 70 pounds of manure a day, and a beef unit is a 1,000 pound unit. We had 56 head, which equated to about 66 units, equaled 4,620 pounds of manure a day. We did six days per acre, 14 tons of manure just short per acre that we got applied as good as any truck can do it. 90% of what goes in the front of the cow comes out the back. What about the increase in organic matter? Because we, as you noticed, this is what it looked like when the cows were done. We do not graze it to the ground. We want to leave at least half, if not two thirds, to feed our low ground livestock. You have to keep that cover on the ground. And again, we've had to learn the hard way during the drought when we thought we had to overgraze something. We found out the hard way that if you leave 85 or 90 percent ground cover, that's pretty good, right? You just won't take it all. Because once you leave bare spots out there, your evaporation is just about as bad as it is with bare soil. You have to leave the ground covered. Value of the urine. I haven't even found numbers for that yet, but I know for every dung pile, there's five urine dumps. And we all know there's a lot of value in that urine as well. And again, it goes back to the cost of the hay, the cost of the manure. I didn't have to swath, rake, bale, haul it to the farm, haul it back to the cow, and haul the used hay out. So what's my carbon footprint doing also, besides more money in my pocket? We've also worked a little bit with bell grazing. This is a, a great way to build soil health fast. Uh, we'll set out enough hay for a week at a time, and just like mob grazing, we'll move the cows through the, through the paddocks with hay instead of forage. Um, here the cows are. Um, we'll, we untie the bales. We don't use rings. Um, they, they waste very little. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And these are, we've also moved our calving now to a spring instead of the winter. And so these are dry cows, so their demand is very little. So we'll put out a couple of good bales of hay, and the rest is low quality. And they get enough energy and protein out of a couple of good days of grazing to get them through the week, to get them back to the next paddock and start over again. Why do I want to bale graze and graze year round? Because this is my alternative in eastern Kansas. Just let me back up one slide. These cows are across the fence from these fat cattle. Thank God these are not mine. We, we've closed the feedlot at this time and we rented it to our neighbor for a couple of years um, to use the cash flow to help build fences and water for our grazing. So these are my neighbor's cows. Who's healthier? Who's happier? Who eats more? Who do you want to buy a steak off of? <laughs> and more and more the consumer is starting to ask these questions about where their food comes from. Which do you want to show them? Which do they want to see? We need to become more aware. It goes back to that raindrop, your responsibility. We got to all fess up, we're all in this together. As you guys have seen by now, you know, I, I, I make some kind of harsh statements and I like to, I don't like to, I point fingers a lot. And part of the reason I can do so, because anything that can go wrong or been done wrong, I've already done it and I'm still doing it. We're all in this together. Uh, this is the bell grazing, as I said, they, they clean it up quite nicely. This is what it looked like when they were done. Uh, if they don't, we'll just come back well, a couple months later and go back across it. That'll give that urine and stuff time to work through the system. and the, they'll be fresh again and they'll come in and clean it up if they do happen to leave a lot, which is, is very seldom. This is what it looked like six weeks later. 
we broadcast seed in front of the cow before they come in and, and bell grazed. We let them plant a forest, and this is what we got. And in the dry year of 2011, this became very, very valuable to us. So again, I, I mentioned earlier about turning co uh, cover crops into cash, and this is one way to do it by bringing in stalkers or custom grazing. The first thing you've got to do when you want to bring livestock on, whether it's pigs, chickens, cows, llamas, deer, I don't care, you've got to have water. Before you have food, you have to find water. Uh, this is how we do it in our area. We, uh, in Kansas, in the wintertime, I, I'm not afraid to make my cows go a quarter to a half a mile, maybe even a mile of water. It's not that big of a deal with a cow. Um, they don't drink much anyway. If we've got snow on, we make them eat snow. We don't even give them access to water when there's snow on because they can get it from the snow. Uh, but in the summertime, and especially well, whether it's cows or stalkers, but in the summertime when it's hotter, if you're making them go more than eight or 900 feet to water, you're losing money because they're walking off pounds, they're walking off condition, and they're, they're going to hurt you in the end. So we've got to keep water close to them in the summertime. So we use a portable tank. And the closer you keep it, the less water you have to have available. Because when you've got them in a tight mob like that, and you've got the water just four or 500 feet away, unless something really goes wrong, everybody in this room isn't going to get up at once and come and get a drink. These guys are going to come get a drink, and they're going to come back and eat, and these guys are going to come get a drink. It's, it's fun to watch. They just cycle through two or four or five at a time. And so you don't, the demand for water is really, really light. You just need to be able to pump it fast. So now when we're running water lines, we're, we're putting these risers every few hundred feet. And these has a quick coupler right down here. So then we just come out, we put garden hose up to this other end of the quick coupler. Just like that. Take it down in and plug it in. Stabilize the pipe from the cows that if they bump the tank or something, they can't knock us around. Float the valve on the other side and have water. And that's about how fast we can do it. That's about how long it takes to plug it in. I already mentioned we moved to the spring cutting. Uh, the fencing, I, I get a lot of pushback and I get laughed at a lot when neighbors driving down the road because they're going to work their ground and one of us is out setting up fence. Well, you sure waste a lot of time. We, it takes us about an hour. If we're moving the cows four or five times a day, it takes about an hour to set up that many moves. Or if you're moving once a day, you come in in an hour or two to set up a week's worth of moves. How much time does it take to swath and rake and mill all the hay? I've never done the math, but I don't think I'm spending any more time and money, probably less than what they're spending hauling all that hay to their cows. And besides that, it's the best hour of the day. When we started, we, we argued, Cody, my, my hired man at the time, and I, you go fix the fence today, I'm going to go call mine. You go set up the Today we argued, I'm going to go do it, you go call mine. It's the best fun of the day. I mean, you're out here with the birds, the butterflies, the honeybees, the, the dung beetles. You can waste a lot of time watching a dung beetle. That's a lot of fun. Uh, so you, you saw the winter grazing that we did in 2010, and the one thing we've learned since then is we want something alive as long as and as much as we can. In Kansas, in, in my area, a lot of times we can stay somewhat green winter round. We get cold, we don't get this cold. So it's not impossible for us to have something green out there most of the time. Even this year, our December was record cold, and our cereal rye still had green tinges to it as the cows were grazing. So what we do today, we'll plant a warm season mix with a cool season mix. Come fall, here we are, October 26th, the sedans and the millets and the cow peas and the, and the sunflowers have all frozen out. We look underneath. So now we have our dry matter, and our protein. I really think you could probably even go through the winter or a lot longer into winter with stalkers gaining good weight out here in a situation like this. Uh, so again, underneath this frozen out, you, then the uh, cool seasons, they get the sunlight, the canopy opens up, and they take off and go to town. And this is a tillage radish or a nitro radish. And another reason you want to do your research, uh, this is one of the brassicas. Uh, as you can see, you know, there's, there's some forage here, it's not great, but there's some. 
There's also forage brassicas now. They've, they've hybridized, they've crossed some of these to produce a forage brassica. And Keith can talk about things back here. He's probably going to talk about them after lunch. And again, you want to do some on-farm research because everything's different, but you have forage brassicas and then you have forage brassicas. They all act a little different, do different things at different times. Another thing we're, we're uh, working with uh, along the lines of the companion crop, cover crop. Uh, this is double crop sunflower planted after a, this would have been triticale, we harvested for grain. We were doing it behind wheat, any of our cereal crops. What I'm doing here, I'm planting a full rate of sunflowers in with a half a rate of a warm season mix and a full rate of a cool season mix. One pass. The goal is, we can harvest the sunflowers for grain. We can bring the cows, the chickens, the sheep in behind it and graze it off. And we're still going to have the cool season mix next spring to come back and be our cover crop. So with one planting, we can grow one cash crop, one grazing crop, maybe two grazing crops, and grow half to all of our fertility for the next year with one pass. <laughs> And guys, are, the guys in Kansas are making this work. Even through the drought, they're getting their sunflowers to two to three hundred pound yields. That's not great, but for what we're experimenting with, that's pretty good, especially for as dry as we can. Right. So this is the mix we planted. This is on August 16th last year. Here we are on September 23rd. And underneath the sunflowers, here come the cool seasons, starting to kick in. Um, we've done some work with white clover. Uh, it's in all of our clover mixes, but it gets a little aggressive. This field here, the white clover seen an opportunity and took it and took over the field. But we've left it. This white clover is now in its third year. We've had a canola crop in, planted into it. We've had a barley crop planted into it, and now a double crop grain sorghum. And the double crop grain sorghum made 40 bushel an acre with no fertility. And not only that, but we probably have all of our fertility for next year's corn crop. So, did it hurt the model crop? Yes. In places where the, the clover was thick, it really hindered the, the canola, the barley, and the mild. But those are things that I can fix. Those are things that I can work on. But I think the future, not only for me, but for, for everybody, and Brendan and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, it doesn't matter whether you're in you know, potato rotation or your wheat belt, corn soybean, that really isn't the answer, even with cover crops. We need perennials in the system. If you're really going to mimic Mother Nature, we, we've got to bring those perennials back also. I don't think we can truly fix the water cycle or the mineral cycle with the shallow rooted annuals, even with livestock. So we have introduced a perennial rotation on our farm. We're now in year five on a couple of fields. The, and basing this off what the Argentinians did several years ago, and it worked very well for them, what we'll do is we'll have a, a perennial mix. This is a cool season mix, which we should have been warm season, and we'll do this in the future. Uh, we'll mop graze it for five to seven years, and we'll cash crop it for five to ten years, and back to the perennials and back to the cash crop. We talked earlier. Do you have any idea what your farm's going to look like in 10 or 20 years? This is a rotation I might not outlive. We're talking about a 15 plus year rotation here. Uh, but it's going to introduce that deeper rooted perennial. It's going to help fix the water cycle. I think it's going to really bring the system together as a whole. Um, I researched this for five years, and 20 minutes after I met Colin Sice, my five years of research went out the window. Colin is planting his cash crops, his annual cash crops, into his native pasture. And his yields match his brothers in the conventional system. Again, this is our single biggest limiting factor. Uh, this, is, this is another picture of the perennial crop. We, we broadcast this in April of 2012, and I'm not sure what the weather was like here in 2012, but for us, we didn't have winter. Summer showed up in April, and the perennial mix we had should have been planted late March. We planted it in mid-April in 2012, and 
and it burned up. We had it, it didn't even come up. We had it, we planted it, broadcast it into an oak cover crop, and the following fall we could find an alfalfa plant here and there. And if you walked long enough and far enough, you might find one grass plant. This is in May of 2013. Again, it's hard to be patient. That's not our strongest virtue. But Mother Nature will reward you when you are. How are we doing on time? We're about there. Okay. I'm about there too, I think. This is, <laughs> this is my garden. Uh, our garden is now no-till also. I think you can see some tomatoes in there. In the beginning, we, did, we tried to do some more version of strip gardening, if you will, and laid down mulch with our companions and our covers to the side. But today, we just let it go. The only hard part is if you want to if you want to make a salad in five minutes, it's pretty hard to do. It takes 15 minutes to find the lettuce and the carrots and the peas. And, <laughs> but other than that, it's a lot of fun. Uh, next year, here we see, you see beans crawling up. We put some fence in for the beans to crawl up. We'll take those out because there's also beans crawling up the flowers. We'll, we'll put more things in that mix. And when you're building your mixes, you need to know why you're putting these things in here. And everything has, everything I do has to have diversity. I, I don't like anything that does one thing. So we've got a sunflower here, really deep rooted. So he's opening up a nice big hole. He's breaking up compaction. In the winter, he's going to feed my cardinals. And in the summer, he's going to hold up my bean plant. He has multiple jobs. He has to do more than one thing. Uh, this is my neighbor's vineyard. Uh, this picture is now four years old. I need to get it updated. But uh, when I started researching cover crops, all, anything that I could find was either 100 years old from great grandpa or come out of California or out of the wine industry. So my neighbor planted an acre of grapes on some of my farm ground. And I said, well, you don't plant cover crops with that? And he goes, that. So he's, he's like me, he loves to learn. So he started researching, we planted some white clover in with his grass strips. And his first harvest of grapes, they actually segregated his grapes from everybody else's at the winery. His yield was through the roof and the quality was higher than anybody else that had that variety of grape. And I said, well, what'd you do? He was, I don't know. I didn't do anything. He fed the soil. He let Mother Nature help. And, and I promise you, this is not what his vineyard looks like today. I'm disappointed I don't have a better picture because today we now have this covered. He's growing all kinds of things. He's growing mustards in there. Uh, my whole goal, I have talked about all the way around this. You can imagine how he likes me. Uh, we have real issues trying to, to spray and keep his grapes alive. So I'm working towards organic no-till. So Lynette uh, grazes her lambs through this vineyard and he gives her a case of wine. I'm going to pay to graze another win win. But I said, Terry, I'm trying to go to organic no till. I've cut down uh, my field around that. We're, we're using very little chemical on there now. What are you doing to my wine? I don't want that to happen to my wine. Either. <laughs> and so now he has that goal. He wants to get to, to uh, no fungicides no insecticides and we're going to use the cover crops. We're going to tear the fescue out because we've learned how damaging fescue is to the soil and he's going to plant this to a, some sort of a native, something that would mimic our system. And we've got to convince these other two owners that that's the right way to go because they're not happy now that we're not doing this. It's more beautiful to us when it's not mother than it is. Okay, sir. Uh, this is Colin Sice harvesting his oats in his native pasture. Value of soil organic matter, and these numbers are outdated, and you plug in what you think, but nitrogen, 50 cents a pound, it's higher than that now. Uh, I know the numbers here, 1% organic matter, 680, and that today, that number is, they're pushing that number up in the $2,000 an acre range for 1% organic matter. And what's that worth? And, you know, if you guys can switch to to uh, pivot irrigation, stop the tillage, increase your organic matter two or three percent. The cost of that irrigation is going to be returned in organic matter and 
labor savings, the time you get to spend with your kids, and higher quality food that you're growing. You just have to have confidence in the system. We're probably out of time. The ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. Again, that's a new group. This was taken at the No Tilled Plains Conference two years ago. Uh, you've already met my son Colby. Those of you that don't know, this is Rolf Dirks. Rolf is the godfather of no-till in South America. He took no-till in South America and got it started with three farmers down there. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, very gentlemanly, just, uh, I have the highest respect for this man. I mean, his knowledge is just out of this world. So, my son came to the conference with me a couple years ago, and I got the pleasure of introducing him to Rolf. And Rolf asked my son what he's doing. My son has returned home and bought an eight-acre farm that he's starting a CSA on. For those of you that don't know, it's kind of like a truck gardening or farmer's market. It's community-supported agriculture. You pay my son so many dollars per month, and he brings you every week or every couple of weeks produce of his choosing of in-season stuff. Rolf had never heard of a CSA. So, for the next 45 minutes, the student became the teacher, and the master became the student. And that's what makes people like this and people like Brendan so great. Their quest for knowledge has never stopped. When they hung that diploma on the wall behind them, I didn't tell them they were done. They went on their next step of the journey. They, they never want to quit learning. It was just a wonderful moment for me to watch that. Far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in a great twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Failure is a Your limitations, until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can fall. 